Now most of us here, I'd imagine, live our lives in a bubble, protected from the knowledge of the horrors of the world. We've been spared the traumas of warfare, most of us, and catastrophe on the one hand, and the kind of day-to-day -day struggles and misery of, say, for example, parents who can't afford to feed their children. In addition, we've ignored these realities because witnessing such suffering is overwhelming. And we, nat we have a natural aversion to pain. We're a very empathetic being. Um, there's something called mirror neurons, which we are hardwired with, that respond to what other people are feeling. So when we see somebody else sad or happy, then if we're normal and not pathological, we will experience in our own neurons a similar kind of sadness or happiness. So that's you know, a very good reason why it's hard to look at what's going on in the world, you know, look at it in the face day after day in order to try and deal with something. It's very, very unpleasant. At the same time, the corporate media gives us a very biased and simplistic view of the world uh, with an infinity of distractions, royal weddings, the Olympics, at the risk of oversimplification, the capitalist economic system, along with the global state structure of independent nations, are, the, are primarily responsible for condemning millions of people to die every year, for most of the violence, for making many, way too many people's lives nasty, brutish, and short. Now, of course, some of these miseries are starting to, to come home into, into Europe, into North America with the economic recession. Austerity, which is a, a, another aspect of the class struggle as far as I'm concerned, uh, has been imposed on the people of Britain, people of Ireland, the people of France, Spain, Greece, and so on. The U.S. is struggling with the greatest downturn since the, uh, since the Great Depression. Not to mention, in my view, capitalism is also the main reason why we're destroying the natural world. And, and the, uh, the outcome of the talks in Cancun uh, that ended yesterday are an example. The most, almost the most important thing I, I could stress today is that it's important to realize that none of the problems that, we're, that we see in the world are necessary. They are all preventable. We have enough knowledge. We have enough wealth. We have enough, enough technology to have sustainable communities, to make sure everybody is fed, everyone gets a decent education, no one has to drink water that's contaminated, uh, that no one has to go hungry, for instance. And I'll give you some examples, but just, for instance, in Canada, the Tory government is talking about spending at least $20 billion on fighter jets. Is that really a priority? Are there not any homeless in this country? Are there not people around the world that could use that money? Could it not be invested in green technology? I mean, again, the, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, on the other hand, and I, f I find this just astounding, uh, in 2009, the combined net worth of the world's 1,011 billionaires increased by $1.2 trillion. So in one year, just the world's billionaires, we're not talking about those only worth a half a billion, just the world's billionaires made or earned another $1.2 trillion. About a quarter of that would end global poverty. That's, that's one of the things I just find astounding. If the world's billionaires gave up one quarter of what they earned extra last year, there'd be no global poverty. If the world's nations took, again, about one-fifth of what we spend on the military to kill people every year, we could end global poverty. Um, the global advertising budget is probably two or three times what it would take to end global poverty, and so on and so on. So I think it's very easy to, to accept the idea that well, poverty is such a huge problem, it's existed for you know forever, for thousands of years, we can't do anything about it. It would cost too much. We'd all be poor if we shared, and so on and so on. It's not even remotely true. So that's why I say everything that we see in terms of artificial scarcities of free time, education, food, water, uh, you know, medical care, all of those things are artificial. They don't need to exist. We, we could actually end all of that. This is why I say the system is, is pathological. But in order to change it, obviously we need to understand the, the situation and understand the problem. The, f the first thing I want to stress is that we do not ha essentially live in a very democratic country. And even in the so-called industrial wor world, we have very limited democracies. Ruling elites in various countries and transnational elites make most of the decisions. Um, and just, just think of all the, for example, again, just one of the many kinds. Look at the so-called war on terrorism. 
the US, Sweden, Canada, NATO is spending hundreds of billions of dollars in Afghanistan and Iraq. According to the documents released by WikiLeaks, uh, the United States government says that most of the funding from al for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban comes not from, say, Pakistan or Afghanistan, it comes from Saudi Arabia, one of our allies. Allies would buy billions of dollars of weapon systems every once in a while. That just may be a coincidence, okay? But why, why are Canadians dying, for, or anybody dying in Afghanistan, when that is not the source of the problem? And, and put it in, in realistic terms, terrorism, and this is not to, you know, to minimize the victims at all, but terrorism is a very, very small part of the problem in terms of people being killed and hurt every day. Again, I find this particular fact per perhaps the most disturbing of all. Every single day, 22,000 children under the age of five years old die from preventable causes. 22,000 every single day. I don't think terrorists have killed that many people you know, this whole year, but every single day, that's how many children die. And I stress, these are from preventable causes. And the system grinds on and the system ignores them. We're putting, in the province of BC, something like a half a billion dollars into a roof for a stadium, and the <laughs> roof doesn't even work. So what, what do we hear? We, we get the food bank appeals. And again, bless the people who support the food bank. But they've been doing it for 24 years on, on CBC. Okay? We could end uh, poverty in BC, and of course, as you know, we have the highest poverty rate in the country. We could end it with a fraction of the amount of money that goes into the roof. Now, again, I'm oversimplifying. You know, it, it's, these are not necessarily simplistic issues, but I want to stress the point that if we were serious about it, and if we had governments that were serious about dealing with these problems, we could do it. Again, it's not a lack of wealth, it's not a lack of technology or knowledge, it's a lack of political will. One of the people that I think I've learned the most from, especially recently, is a guy named Philip Zimbardo. You might know him from the Stanford Prison Experiment. He's a social psychologist. And what he stressed is that even good people with the best of intentions put in a system and a situation uh, that demands that they, for example, give electric shocks to people or commit war crimes or ignore uh, the effects of, say, thalidomide on the, on the, uh, the babies of, of mothers who take that particular drug, um, that the system will bring out the worst in us. It's the system that brings out the worst in people, I think. Um, what we need to do is change the systems of power. Looking at Canada, again, we send troops to die and fight in Afghanistan to prevent Canadians from dying, supposedly. But an example of, of structural violence, the, the uh, Canadian Medical Association in 2008 says that air pollution in Canada kills 21,000 Canadians every year. Could you imagine if there was a terrorist group killing 21 Canadians every year? We have martial law, but like we almost had in Toronto in G20, that's another disturbing sign. 21,000, and what has our government done about it? What has the previous go liberal governments done about it? Essentially nothing. The problem keeps getting worse. That's irrational. That's pathological in my point of view. Um, instead of, as crime rates de decrease, and in spite of the fact that every study that looks at the causes of crime says things like, well, if we give more support to mothers and children, if we provide after-school counseling and sports for kids, and so on and so on, you actually reduce crime, you reduce the number of people hurt, you reduce policing costs. What did the, was the Tory government said? We need more prisons. <laughs> as poverty increases and so on, as are cut back to the education system. I mean, it used to be um, most of my students could get a decent amount of, in terms of grants, and bursaries. Now most of them have to get loans. So they end up twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in debt. There's, there's an unemployment crisis anyway. Um, it, it's really difficult to watch some who are, especially single parents, trying to work, look after their children, and go to school. Again, we could afford like Norway does, like Cuba does, like Greece does, you know, some of those aren't rich countries, to, let, to uh, afford to fund every child who wants to go to school to work their way through the system as far as, as far as they can go. We choose not to. And the other person I want to mention is Joe Hill. Joe Hill was a, an organizer for the Industrial Workers of the World a long time ago. He was executed for his political activities. And before he died, he said, don't mourn, organize. And that's the key. 
is I think voting is critical. I'll give you one simple example. If enough people had come out in the U.S. in their uh, midterm elections to prevent the Republicans from taking over uh, the House of Representatives, there would be much more of a chance, for example, that uh, the millionaires and billionaires would not be getting that Bush era tax cut. There'd be much more of a chance that the U.S. government might actually do something about global warming that might actually pull out of Afghanistan earlier rather than, rather than later. One can be very pure. All voting, is, as Murray Bookchin said, is part of the cesspool of bourgeois parliamentarianism. Yes, it is. And, it's part of, and, and there are a lot of problems with uh, liberal democracy. But to ignore this, this very important democratic uh, tool, voting, I think is a serious mistake, especially in the short run. I think we need to demand more democracy and we need to participate more to make it real. I'm trying to show this continuum here. Well, we have to make global changes. We can do a lot in our daily lives to make things somewhat better. And let me just end with a couple of quick quotations. And I promise I will end and, and I welcome any kind of discussion afterwards. Schopenhauer again, in his writing called The Suffering of the World, he said, and again, this is a kind of a sexist thing, but he was writing 300 years ago. The proper form of address is not sir, but my fellow sufferer. This may perhaps sound strange, but it reminds us of that which is after all the most necessary thing in life. The tolerance, patience, regard, and love of neighbor of which everyone stands in need and which therefore everyone owes to each other. I came across this great quotation from Buddha. It would not be true to say that the cultivation of loving kindness and compassion is part of our practice. It would be true to say that the cultivation of loving kindness and compassion is all of our practice. And the, the, uh, I'll be giving a follow-up talk to this at the, the downtown library uh, at noon on, I think, the 19th of January, titled, What If We Listen to Our Hearts? What if we t looked at our hearts, again, knowing ourselves and acted on our best impulses? Treated, again, treated people well, we're good to ourselves. Um, one of the bits of wisdom that I heard at this conference in, in California was to the effect of, uh, follow the advice you would give to your best friend. <laughs> you know, don't be hard on yourself. It's tough on everybody. Give yourself a break. Don't beat up on yourself. Just, just move on. Um, and so, what if we took the golden rule seriously, for instance, and organized to create a world based on solidarity, justice, peace, and even love? Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein said uh, in the 1950s, something that I think we, we should remember all the time. I try and do it. Above all, remember your humanity. And to me, when you remember your own humanity, your own, you're in touch with your own heart, you cannot ignore the humanity of anybody else as well. You see them like you see yourself. That's not easy to do. We live in a society with the foundation of which ultimately is selfishness, is greed, is profit. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but not that much. We have to listen to our heart. We have to remember our humanity. And, it, and I'll just close with uh, one of my favorite quotes from John Lennon. I may be a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And uh, I hope that, uh, that you can hang on to your dreams as well. Thank you very much.